in view of the historical fact that the cartel will ultimately, I mean, be break down, as you stated in the case of rubber and steel. My question is this, why President Jimmy Carter keep on talking about energy crisis? The first question is, it certainly had, I mean, political implication. Mm -hmm. To what extent the American, I mean, people will be benefited. And as you just mentioned, this is, the tendency is towards, I mean, the, on the way to na nationalization. Would that be beneficial to the Democrat Party or the American people? Well, that's kind of, it would be, in my view, it would be very harmful to the American people. But it's not, but whether it would be politically profitable or not is a much more complicated question. I assume that President Carter is talking about an energy crisis because he believes, rightly or wrongly, that it is politically profitable to do so. I suspect that he is more, he is, he is better qualified to judge political profitability than I am. At least his track record would suggest that. <laughs> so I'm not about to double guess. I'm not about to uh, to uh, 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 to double guess him uh, on the question of whether it's politically profitable. Now the more important question is why is it politically profitable? And that's what I was trying to explain briefly. It's politically profitable because politics is the art. Well, you know, James Schlesinger, before he became uh, Secretary of Energy, and before he indeed he came into the government when he was still simply an economist, wrote a fascinating article in which he said, among other things, that politics is the art of calculated cheating. <laughs> and that's right. It's the art of giving and appearing to be able to distribute benefits so that the benefits are visible, and the costs are hidden. Well, the purpose of an energy pro policy from a political point of view is to have benefits to distribute that are visible and costs that are invisible. You cannot have a situation in which you appear to be distributing benefits unless there is a crisis. If everything is fine and everything is going along well and there's no problem and nothing to do, and therefore, it has always been politically profitable to have crises. It's just a question of what kind of a crisis you have. <laughs> so I don't believe it's difficult to understand why you call it a crisis. The question is whether somehow or other, by trying to make, uh, have greater public understanding of the issues, we can make it politically unprofitable. Thank you. If, as you've suggested, uh, the government is so very intent on nationalizing the oil industry. Can you explain why it's first attacking it uh, through the mechanism of vertical and horizontal divestiture, unless, as perhaps uh, it appears to me anyway, it's doing it to fragment what now is a very viable example of free enterprise, to then come back and pull it back together under its own aegis and say, now we saved it, and we're running it in a coherent fashion. But is this a really reasonable thing to do, to free enterprises that works now, to a good coherent organization, to jobs, to perhaps national security and welfare? Uh, I think there are several uh, points involved in your question. First of all, there isn't such a thing as the government view or the view. Uh, you have, a, uh, you have a, uh, many independent fiefdoms in what is supposedly a government. You have many independent views. One group will be moving for divestiture, while another group may well be moving in the opposite direction. So it isn't necessary to have a coherent view. But in the second place, a major component of the movement has to be in, in all these areas is to try to establish the inadequacy or inequity or 
evil of the industry to provide a case for having the government control it and run it. Now there are many levels in which you can do that. And one of those levels is to complain that it's a great, that it's a monopoly, which is unfairly uh, exploiting the consumer and that it's able to get that monopoly power because it's vertically integrated. So in part, the move for horizontal divestiture must not be interpreted necessarily as a serious move to divest it, but simply as part of the propaganda campaign against the oil industry as an efficient, effective, competitive industry. Needless to say, I think that that is a, a very undesirable movement. I do not believe there is any evidence or any significant evidence that aside from government involvement, the oil industry is imperfectly competitive. It's rather very competitive. I think a lot of people agree there. Yeah, essentially all professional economists who have looked into the competitive state of the industry have agreed that absent government involvement, it would be a highly competitive industry. So in answer to your question, I see no point to divestiture, and I don't think it'll get anywhere really. And I think it's just part of the general propaganda attack against the oil industry, which establishes a climate of opinion that is favorable to increased government controls over the industry. I speak of nationalization. That doesn't mean that you have to have literal government ownership and <coughs> operation of the industry. If, uh, if government bureaucrats uh, can use that $10 billion pot they have to decide who produces what, who consumes what, well, then you have essentially control over the industry, whether the name is private enterprise or not. Thank you. Thank you. Um. Mr. Friedman, uh, you have reiterated what I'm sure that most of us recognize, that um, big business, oil industry in particular, but really all big business, and perhaps even a lot of small business, has gone, quote, gone to bed with the government and is now reaping the sad benefits of you it. You and me, too. <laughs> um, we seem to have a situation that uh, I don't find an answer for in that our college students, when polled, hate two things very strongly, big government and big business. Mm -hmm. Now, it's to our advantage to try to reduce the big government to have them hating big government. But I do not know how we separate their hate of big government and big business, particularly since People like my own congressman, George Miller, at a recent town hall when he was uh, uh, telling everybody why we must have the energy program, said uh, we must conserve energy. And I asked the question, uh, I'm certain that you understand about uh, uh, Carter's MOPS Energy Group that estimated a 600-year supply of natural gas given the free market. And he said, yes, but he said, we must conserve our energy for future generations. And I said, George, 600 years. And with that, you know, he looked around the audience and he said, I will not let the oil industries rape you. <laughs> and of course, got cheers. Now, as long as they can play this way, we are not going to be able to separate big government being able to blame the oil industry for what is happening. So my question, it's a long way to get there, I realize, but my question is, how given the fact that maybe industry will wake up and stop playing the game with big government, but that seems almost unlikely since it's to their benefit and we are all self-motivated, self-interested. Uh, how are we going to break this combination, which we have to break in order to be able to destroy the big monster of big government? Well, I don't know that I want to break the combination. I'm opposed to big business and I'm opposed to big government and I think they are in bed with one another. I'm pro-free enterprise, but I'm not pro-business. Those are two very different things, and you must not confuse them. Free enterprise means competition. And the reason I'm in favor of free enterprise is because it's the only system known to man which prevent capitalists from having too much power. But when capitalists, when you combine ownership of property with government political power, you have too much power concentrated. If you have free enterprise, if you have competition, then one power is offset against the other power, and you can hope to keep it in check. There are big businesses which have been very beneficial to the American people. They have been responsible 
for much of our productivity. And I'm not trying to eliminate the productive efficiency of big business. But I think that the students are right in believing that the future of this country is threatened not alone by big government, but by the extent to which businesses contribute to that. I have often said that the two greatest enemies of free enterprise are on the one hand my fellow intellectuals and on the other hand the businessmen for opposite reasons. Every intellectual is in favor of freedom for himself and against freedom for everybody else. And every businessman is in favor of freedom for everybody else, but special privilege for himself. He wants a tariff. Now, I think that the college student is right to believe that when U.S. Steel comes out, when the steel industry comes out and says, we believe in competition, but we want you to restrict the import of steel, I think they're right to say they're a bunch of hypocrites. When the oil industry or when companies in the oil industry come out and say, well, we recognize, as they do, even the best of them in their advertisement, we recognize that you cannot let windfall profits develop. And therefore, we are in favor of decontrol, but gradual, please. Well, that's hypocrisy. So I'm not going to, I'm not really going to join you in your crusade to try to separate the attitudes about this. I think what we need to do is to try to have people understand the virtues of free enterprise, of competition. And if you had, in fact, part of the reason business is as big as it is in many areas is because government is as big as it is. If you look at most of the governmental regulations, the most of the governmental activities, the tax structure, they have had the effect of leading to larger scale enterprises than would be socially desirable. So that uh, I think that if you could get a proper governmental policy, you would end up with much less big business than you now have. Well, I see their attitude as Who's don't there now? the college students yeah. that, that I talk to. I see their attitude as being big government must not control me, but it must control big business. Uh, right, that's the way And it's so this is, this is but, where but I'm trying to separate view, things. What, you, what I say to them, what I say to these students is something different. I say, you are right, we don't want big government to control us. But you're kidding yourself if you think that big government's gonna control big business. The history of this is always that well-meaning people like you who have favored governmental controls on big business have ended up being the front men for the big businessmen they would never knowingly serve. Because what happens is that every time you set up one of these supposed controls, the business comes and takes it over. <laughs> so if you want to control big business, you rely on competition, on an open door. Uh, I have a standard question I sort of ask, a part of the question I ask to people who talk about the, the vices of big business. I say, suppose you could pass one law for the sole and solitary purpose of increasing competition. No other purpose. What law would you pass? And they very seldom come up with the right answer. So, you know, they come up with stories like doubling the budget of antitrust or setting a limit of no single company can have more than X percent of an industry or things like that. The right answer is very simple and everybody will immediately recognize it. Complete international free trade. Abolish all tariffs, all restrictions on imports. That would do far more to introduce competition and prevent monopoly than any, well, than, than, than uh, anything you could do in the antitrust area directly. You know, it's an interesting thing that if I look at the, uh, rec uh, at the behavior of business organizations, if I look at the NAM or the Chamber of Commerce, and any given issue there is likely to be on the wrong side is on the right side. The only organization that is almost always on the right side is the National Federation of Independent Business. Why? Because it represents small business. Why? Not because small businessmen are nobler than big <coughs> businessmen, but because they know they can't get anywhere through government <laughs> while the big businessmen can. So don't you try to defend the big business. They'll take care of themselves. You spoke of the oil industry today. Aren't we really speaking of the energy industry? Yes. And if so, um, what is to prevent this industry, which has tremendous economies of scale in transportation and in uh, raising capital, uh, once uh, the deregulation of gas uh, comes about under a free market situation, 
from uh, basically indexing all energy supplies and then maximizing profit. That is, the question is, would a monopoly arise? Exactly. Uh, why ha didn't it arise in the uh, uh, prior 80 years, 100 years? Why is it? After all, uh, all of these factors you're describing were present before the price of oil in particular was regulated. Why didn't it happen then? The answer is that you must distinguish between individual size of an individual enterprise and the total industry. It's an enormous industry. You can have very, very large enterprises, but a good many of them. Moreover, in every industry, whether oil or anything else, you have large by the side of small. And what effectively prevents monopoly is the fact that attempted monopolization introduces an incentive for people to come in and break down the monopolization, induces small people to come in alongside the big ones. So I think there is neither reason in history nor in logic to, exp to suppose that the so-called energy industry would become effectively monopolized. You have many sources of energy. You have competition not only between different gas producers, not only between different producers of oil, but between oil and gas, between them and electricity, between them and coal. Solar energy will be coming in. New forms of energy will be coming in. I do not believe that. The, I think this problem of a monopoly emerging is a false problem and is not one that you ought to be, need to be seriously concerned with, except insofar as the government steps in and enforces it. Yes, ma'am. Do you feel that, that we will eventually see complete decontrol of a uh, government decontrol of oil and natural gas? And if so, um, how long do you feel it would be before the uh, alternate sources of energy and uh, additional exploration and so forth would eliminate the energy crisis? Well, if you had, well, let's take that in steps. If the price of natural gas and oil were deregulated tomorrow, the energy crisis would end tomorrow. It would take no time. There is no energy crisis, fundamentally. Where's the energy crisis? What is it, what is it that bespeaks a crisis? The only thing that, produces a, that bespeaks a crisis is that you have handcuffs on the production, distribution, and use of oil through government controls. So there would be no good. The crisis would end tomorrow. On the first part of your question, uh, I doubt very much that we will ever get to the complete decontrol of oil and gas prices. I hope I'm wrong. But I doubt very much that we will get to it. It looks to me as if we're heading the other way. We did not erect, you know, uh, Winston Churchill once remarked, I did not become prime minister in order to uh, preside over the dissolution of the empire, which is exactly what he did, of course. <laughs> and maybe I, I started out on that thinking it was going to lead me one way, but it seems to me leading me to the opposite. <laughs> because the empire did dissolve, and I was going to start to say, I don't think James Schlesinger became Secretary of Energy in over, o order to preside over the dissolution of the Energy Department. But I hope maybe, when it, maybe Churchill's example will be powerful. <laughs> At any rate, I'm very pessimistic about the fact of ultimate decontrol, effective decontrol. There are too many political advantages for maintaining it, and it's so hard to think of any other examples. Tell me. We've had precedents in this in many areas. Where have we had decontrol? Railroad prices were first put on, railroad fares were first put under control in 1880-something. They're still under control. Uh, the charges for trucking, sometime in what, 1920 or so? They're still under control. Uh, it's very hard uh, to think of those government regulations that have been abolished. In fact, one of the major, not, not one, perhaps the major argument against government involvement in these measures, in these activities, is that it's easier to start than it is to stop. See, the great virtue, people have a misunderstanding about what the virtue of a private enterprise system is. They talk about it as a profit system. But it's a profit and loss system. And the loss part is as important as the profit part. Because what it means is that an unsuccessful experiment has to be terminated. But when the government has an unsuccessful experiment, it simply doubles the budget. 
so that I am not optimistic about ending controls. Thank you. You're welcome. Excuse me, Dr. Green, can I just ask a point on that? Maybe it's somewhat larger, but... Come around here. Come around here. We're going to enforce discipline on you, <laughs> unaccustomed as you are. <laughs> yes, sir. Come on ahead, and he'll take his turn. Uh, Dr. Friedman, there's a great deal of debate, both nationally and particularly here in California, about generational electricity through nuclear sure. power. I wonder if you could give us your comments on that and mention also what you're feeling in, in terms of government regulation of nuclear power and really government direction and Carter's proposal that the breeder reactor program basically be canceled and so on. I'm not enough of an expert to, to comment particularly on the breeder reactor. That gets you into a problem which really is not at all an economic problem. It has a problem of the extent to which that would contribute to the proliferation of nuclear weapons. The fundamentally, the argument against the breeder reactor that I can recognize as making a great deal of sense is the argument that it would, that its development and its, its, uh, it would make it far easier for countries to develop in very quick time a weapons capability. And I'm not competent to evaluate that. But let me go back, so let me go back to the first question. The gov we have taken a measure, the government has taken measures which makes it, which has, in a way, uh, uh, hampered the possibility of allowing nuclear energy to be produced under appropriate free market conditions. Namely, the measures to limit the liability. You see, there is a measure which limits the liability of, an, of a nuclear generating plant for uh, harm which may be done to others as a result of accidents. Now that's, I think, a very unfortunate measure. A free enterprise system is one under which people are responsible for what they do. And it is appropriate that a nuclear generating uh, uh, station should be subject to the same responsibility in case of harm to others as any other activity. And by limiting the damages that could be assessed against it, the government has essentially reduced the private incentive to, minimize, to, to, to make the uh, production of nuclear energy safe. If that could be eliminated, it seems to me that the first step that ought to be taken is to eliminate that limit so as to make it really a private enterprise thing. Beyond that, it seems to me, nuclear energy ought to compete on an even keel with other forms of energy. I believe that the, there has been an emotional reaction against nuclear energy that is completely unjustified, so far as I can see, in terms of the evidence about its safety and about its, uh, <coughs> how, how, uh, what can be done to prevent, uh, to store and prevent harm from coming from the byproducts of it. So on the whole, I have very little doubt that we are going to make much less use of nuclear energy than it would be desirable to do. But I don't have any very good suggestions about how to do anything about it except, on the one hand, to impose responsibility, and the other to try to counter the hysteria and the tendency, irrationally, to link the uh, uh, production of energy with other aspects of nuclear fission. As you know, the record is incredible. The safety record of the nuclear generating plants has been very, very much better than that of the, the fossil plants. So that uh, on objective grounds, it's very hard to justify the hue and cry about nuclear energy. And I don't believe that is on objective grounds. I think that's entirely on a emotionally irrational grounds. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir what you consider to be the continued effect of the current balance of payments. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you know, there's, uh, as you know, one of the major arguments that is made about the problem of oil is that somehow or other it's responsible for the weak dollar abroad. That supposedly we have a balance of payments deficit because we're spending so much on foreign oil. Well, you can immediately see that that's a bunch of nonsense if you, uh, because we import, what is it, not le less than half of our oil. Germany and Japan import 100% of their oil. If our importing half of our oil makes the dollar weak, 
Why does importing all of the oil make the mark in the end strong? <laughs> Obvious, obviously, there must be something wrong with that argument. And of course, there is. The dollar is weak, not because we're importing oil, but because we're producing pieces of paper, namely money. The dollar is weak because our inflation rate has been higher and our anticipated rate of inflation is higher than the inflation rate of Germany, of Switzerland, of Japan. That's why our dollar is weak. We have a large balance of payments deficit. You can almost reverse it. Instead of asking why do we have a large balance of payments deficit, it would be interesting to ask th this question. If we have a balance of payments deficit, somebody must be accumulating those dollars. If we're spending more dollars than other people are using to buy our goods, what's happening to the difference? Somebody must be holding it. And so you might ask the question, why is it that people are willing to add $30 billion at foreigners? We're willing last year to add something like $30 billion to the amount of dollars they hold. You could interpret that as a sign of enormous confidence in the strength of the United States. That's not a sign of weakness. Well, it may or may not be. It depends on who holds those dollars and why. In point of fact, a considerable volume of those dollars have been accumulated by foreign central banks, the German central bank and the Japanese central bank, because they have been unwilling to allow the value of their currency to appreciate vis-a-vis -vis the dollar. But that's their doing. Insofar as they're doing that, they're giving us a gift. They're uh, uh, providing us with goods without our, our having to ship out any goods to them. There is no area in which things tend to be upside down so much as in the area of international trade, where it's common to regard exports as a good thing and imports as a bad thing. But of course, it's the other way around from the point of view of the consumer. Imports are what, are what we are able to consume, what's ena able to ena uh, what enables us to have a higher standard of life. Exports are what we have to pay for it. If foreign countries, if Japan is perfectly willing to send us television sets and steel and so on, and take green pieces of paper in return, bigger fools we not to take them up on it. <laughs> But of course, they're not willing to do it. At any rate, from the point of view of this talk, so far as energy is concerned and oil is concerned, it's a strict red herring. The balance of payment issue is a very different issue, and it's almost entirely unrelated to the problem of our oil imports. What is true is that because we have been discouraging domestic production and subsidizing foreign production, we are reducing our standard of life. We're handing over to the OPEC countries a larger chunk of resources for oil than we need to do, and that's making us poor. That's true. It has nothing to do with the balance of payments deficit or with the, uh, with the uh, uh, weakened dollar. Thank you for asking you. the question. <laughs> I think we had better uh, close it off. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. For being here.